so the panel um, now is on the, the foreign policy and political implications of, of China's economic situation, we'll say, because one debate we might have is whether indeed China is hitting a crisis or whether this is um, not a crisis but a rebalancing um, and, a, and, a, and a reconfiguration of the Chinese economy that's intentional on the part of the leadership, as is Xi Jinping's um, contention. So uh, I'm Meg with my, I'm a professor at the, the business school across the river. Um, I focus on China's political economy and I'm very excited to have three excellent panelists here today. Um, and, and one framing we might have is many of you have seen um, recent discussions in the press as well as in scholarly journals of peak China, right? So the idea that China has peaked economically and what implications that might have for its external behavior. And so we have three different perspectives based on, I think, three different parts of the world or at least three different sets of considerations um, for much, much fruit for discussion. So, Yeling. Thank you. Uh, and while we're waiting for the slides to be loaded, um, let me just uh, quickly thank the organizers. So my talk will be uh, focusing on how China's economic slowdown slash situation is, might affect foreign policy relations uh, between China and the United States and between China and Germany slash Europe more broadly. In the interest of time, um, if we talk about China's overall uh, economic slowdown, has, is the economy slowing down? If you look over the trajectory of the past, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, of course it is, right? And the drivers of that are, are several. The first is just a secular trend uh, as China's economy matures. The second factor will be demographics as China's uh, population ages and also as it tries to adjust from several decades of having a one China policy. Uh, but we see that the Chinese party state has also explicitly shifted its overall positioning from uh, its 2017 uh, revision of the party constitution, wherein the party explicitly um, noted that it was no longer searching or seeking for quantitative development, but rather is headed towards qualitative development. It's no longer seeking high digits for the sake of it. Uh, so these are all some key factors, and I want to focus my talk today on the uh, a broader driver, I think, of China's economic readjustment, which is economic securitization. And I want to talk not just about economic securitization in China, but also economic securitization in the United States, and in Germany slash Europe more broadly, because I think the overall uh, foreign policy implications of what's happening in China's ec economy domestically will be viewed through and filtered through the securitization of the economy that's happening in all three uh, major economic regions of the world. So we start first by thinking about China's uh, domestic approach to economic security uh, I would put to you that it's been primarily driven by a disillusionment and a, and, and a desire to uh, reconfigure a prior economic model that was no longer working for its purposes. And here I'm obviously building on the work of, of Meg and uh, Kelly Tai and, and Margaret Pearson in their work on party state capitalism, where a lot of what we see happening in China's domestic political economy is an attempt to rectify some of the failures of state capitalism, right, which was successful in some regard, but also led to widespread environmental degradation, corruption, deepening inequality, the buildup of financial risk, an overleveraged property sector, and what the party calls the disorderly expansion of capital. So, as the range of domestic threats to stability and regime security built up, we saw in 2014 the Chinese party state looking to uh, take stock. All right, so in 2014, um, the CCP put out a new comprehensive national security concept that, re, um, that basically uh, encompassed and reintegrated uh, the economy within a broader framework of security. But at that point in time, the, the sources of security risks were mostly domestic. So layering onto that, I, um, 
the third uh, component of China's approach to economic security comes from the external economy. And this goes back a number of years, from tw in 2013 with the Snowden revelations, right? We see uh, the Chinese government um, over time reconfiguring its approach to globalization and shifting away from seeing it as primarily a source of opportunity towards seeing it as also increasingly a source of vulnerability, right? And that's especially um, from the Trump administration <coughs> onwards with the U.S. exercise of choke points in, in uh, technology, um, technology goods in particular. And so with all of these uh, shifts in China's approach to economic security, we see the Chinese government in 2021 with its 14th five-year plan elevate security to the same plank as development, right? So now the overall call is to coordinate development and security rather than a full-out um, drive for development by itself. In last spring's restructuring uh, of the party state, we see the, we see the Chinese government's overarching priorities laid out quite clearly for the rest of, world to, of, of the world to observe, right? There were two central, there were two commissions um, that were set up in the central committee. One is to strengthen and tighten centralized supervision over financial governance. And the other one is a whole of nation drive <coughs> towards science and technology development. And therefore, what we see in terms of the new orientation towards economic uh, governance in China is a, is a downgrading of consumption-driven growth, right? Whereas it used to be in the mid-2010s um, a high priority for the Chinese government for China to engage in structural reforms to shift towards a more consumption-driven economy, that's clearly taken a back burner now. What we see now happening is the reallocation of resources towards high-tech development, technology self-sufficiency, what the party calls new productive forces to upgrade the infrastructure and so on. So if you put these various factors together, right, what you have is a um, fairly lukewarm uh, domestic consumption, or at least in the long term, it's not going to be expanding anytime quickly we have deflationary pressures um, and on top of that a full-on driving of resources towards high-tech manufacturing. What that will produce is excess capacity and what that, that is already producing excess capacity that will then be exported to the rest of the world. And that excess capacity is what I want to focus on in terms of thinking about foreign policy implications. So. Um, if we had the slides up, you would be able to see a graph of China's current account surplus. And what's striking about China's current account surplus is that it has increased dramatically over the past uh, three to four years. And currently, it is a, at a level that is as high as what it was back in 2009. So this obviously is going to have repercussions for China's uh, major trading economies. Is there anything new here, right? So excess capacity from Chinese econ China's economy is not new. Um, we've had disputes over steel and solar panels in the past. What is new is that in the past, um, these disputes were, w w governments were able to confine these disputes fairly narrowly within the economic pillar or economic relationship. Now with securitization happening in all these major economies, the excess capacity is going to be interpreted and played out through the lens of economic security rather than just a quote unquote normal trade dispute. So I want to therefore highlight the, um, I want to pivot now to looking at how then the United States is uh, dealing with China's surging current account surplus. And before doing that, I think it's worth taking a step back to say, well, how does the United States view, uh, what is the US view of economic security? And here I would put to you that it is also based on a growing and, and uh, disillusionment over the value of its prior economic model, right? So, and, and Jake Sullivan has been quite active in communicating the sources of this disillusionment over in his speeches in the past couple of years, right? So the U.S. Uh, government no longer sees value 
uh, or at least is increasingly skeptical of efficiency, of market efficiency for efficiency's sake, right? Because they see it as having led to the outsourcing of, crit outsourcing of critical capabilities to China. Uh, the US government no longer sees trade as a source of strengthening, rather it sees trade as a source of weakening because trade with China in particular and their narrative has led to the hollowing out of manufacturing, it's led to uh, rising inequality, and it's, led to, it's also fed political polarization in ways that the, the government sees as very damaging to its domestic liberal um, democracy. And it is also increasingly jaded with the value of multilateral institutions in, in, in peacefully integrating a rise in China um, and its skepticism over the value of China's entry into the World Trade Organization is a case in point there. Right? So you add all of these various sources of disillusionment together and what you get is an approach to economic security focused on China that's encapsulated in, in the posture of invest, align, and compete. Right, so invest, that's US domestic industrial policy, right, the IRA, uh, the Chips and Science Act, align, right, so increasing efforts with China's bilateral partners, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and compete. And here we see the slew of uh, measures that have been released uh, targeted at China from the tariffs to the export controls, uh, strengthened CFIUS screening, outbound investment screening, and so on. With China's economy now undergoing its own readjustment, right, moving towards whatever the new normal might be, and the exporting of excess capacity, right, how do these two things interact? So here is where I think the normal uh, interest group politics of trade end up not playing out the way we think it might play out because of securitization. So the tariffs are still in place, right? There are 25% tariffs on Chinese imports. And without, absent those, uh, absent those tariffs, what we would see happening is that US consumers should be receiving the benefits of cheaper Chinese exports, right, into the, into the US uh, domestic economy. That's not happening, right? Uh, if you look at, if you had the PowerPoint, you would see a graph of <laughs> China's, it's funny because in my head I have these great figures. <laughs> um, imagine a line that is not going up, right? That is China's um, imports into, or China's exports into the U.S., right? Um, since the tariffs were put in place, uh, U.S. imports from the rest of the world have gone up and above trend, whereas China uh, imports from China are, you know, um, uh, far below that, far below trend. So that means that the usual beneficiaries of excess capacity are not receiving that, those benefits. Uh, what, but U.S. firms are being hurt, right, in relative terms now with, uh, with um, uh, just in share exchange rate terms, U.S. exports are going to be less competitive uh, compared to Chinese exports. If we think about U.S. firms that are invested in China for the domestic market, so they're in China for China, those firms are probably struggling as well because um, the domestic economy is not doing as well as it was previously. If we think about U.S. firms that are in China in order to export, those firms should be benefiting um, from excess capacity and, and um, but they might not be in the sense that A, many of these firms were leaving already uh, because costs in China have been rising, but B, many of these firms have been diversifying and implementing a China plus one strategy because the overall geopolitical uh, situation has not changed. So their, like China's economic slowdown um, has important costs for the, Chinese, uh, for the US economy, for US consumers, for US firms, but these interest group politics would not play out the, the way they normally would because of economic securitization, right? The cost of these, um, the cost to US producers, the cost to consumers will all be absorbed and justified through the security lens. Just as with China's reallocation of resources domestically towards all of this high-tech manufacturing and downgrading of consumption-driven growth, that has cost the Chinese economy. That will be absorbed through a national security lens. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit on the case of electric vehicles, right? Because that's the one bright spot in China's economy right now. EV exports are doing really well, but that's also causing trade policy tensions. 
if we look at uh, Chinese EV exports to the United States, what you would see in the very beautiful graph um, <laughs> that I wanted to show you is that the U.S.'s imports of electric vehicles from the rest of the world have indeed been on, on, uh, going up, but they're going up from um, it's, it's Korean EVs, it's German EVs, uh, and coming from Mexico, right? If you look at the trend line for Chinese EV imports into, US, into the U.S., they're flat. And the reason for that is very straightforward. The reason for that is a 20, 27.5% tariff on, on electric vehicles, right? So there's just a trade barrier there. And also domestically, the IRA tax credit, right, is explicitly designed to exclude um, electric vehicles that have Chinese components. So um, not only are U.S. consumers shielded by the tariffs in, in all manner of goods, they're also shielded from uh, China's EV export surge. And that is costly, right? It's costly to the green transition uh, in, in the U.S. because uh, some of these, these EVs are, are some of the best that can be found in the world market right now. But again, those costs are going to be absorbed through the lens of national security. If anything, we see rhetoric and recommendations coming from Washington, D.C. that are seeking to become even more muscular in the face of EV imports from China that are not coming in. Right, so we see recommendations for the U.S. government to increase and strengthen its... Uh, so these are the EV exports. Uh, so you see the red line um, that there is China, right? Whereas the rest of the world, um, uh, the U.S. is importing a lot more electric vehicles from the rest of the world. Uh, so in terms of just broad foreign policy um, ramifications, one could think uh, of one camp within the U.S. that looks at the tariffs and say, this is great, right? We're insulated from excess capacity. Let's keep those tariffs on because it's only going to increase our negotiating leverage with China. Um, and even though uh, EVs are not currently, right, in terms of just sheer import numbers, um, impacting the domestic economy, right, I think there is a potential as China's economy weakens for the U.S. to respond by amping up the muscularity of its foreign policy uh, rather than dampening it down, right, e even though according to one line of logic you might think a weaker Chinese economy is less of a threat to the U.S., but I think the opposite is going to happen because all of these economic um, uh, trends are playing out within the lens of national security. So let's move to Germany, right? So what is Germany's approach to economic security? So here, I think it's really interesting. If you, if you read Germany's China strategy, right, it seems to be uh, founded um, upon a pretty basic confidence in the value of its existing economic model, right? In stark contrast to the United States, in stark contrast to China, right? The, the document, um, opens by saying it's thanks to the social market economy that the Federal Republic has become one of the world's strongest economies following its foundation in 1949. Um, and I think in Europe, it's really the shock of Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine that has had the bigger impact in shifting uh, China policy as compared to the trade impact, uh, the China shock trade impact in the United States. Uh, that's not to say that economics have nothing to, uh, uh, don't have a role. I think the German economy is very much struggling to figure out how to um, deal with China's uh, ever-strengthening industrial capabilities. So back in 2019, you see the Federation of Industries issuing a policy document calling for an explicit rethinking um, of Germany's approach to what they call China's state-controlled economy. And Germany in general is no longer embracing their earlier philosophy of change through trade, but rather it's an approach of seeking to redress um, or address key asymmetries, right, in, uh, in terms of de the dependence on critical industries, in terms of uh, seeking reciprocity and economic treatment, but it is also founded in upon a fundamental faith in international st institutions and, uh, and sees value in binding China more tightly to the international order. 
So all of Germany's policies are obviously going to be coordinated at the EU level. So at the EU level, you see these new policies targeted at China coming out, right? So FDI screening, anti-coercion instrument, foreign subsidies regulation. On the surface, it might look like the EU and the US are moving um, more closely together, but I would, I, I would emphasize that they are, these instruments are being um, stood up but being driven by, I think, fairly different conceptions, domestic conceptions of what, con what comprises economic security and what model of economic governance best serves one's own domestic economy. So I think it's, it's important to bear that in mind. Um, but moving to, back to the topic of EVs, right? So because the EU doesn't have the same type of tariffs against Chinese imports, it is, of course, more exposed to excess capacity. Right? And so you see the EU Trade Commissioner complaining about the historic high levels of trade deficits um, that the EU has with China prior to, to uh, visiting China. And there is an ongoing subsidy probe uh, into electric vehicles. And the reason why is very clear if you look at this figure, which is from Merits, right? So the blue bars are the EU's um, exports of uh, automotive trade into China, and the light blue bars are, are the components of those that are EVs, right? So it's very small into China. The red bars are China's auto imports or exports into the European market. Salmon pink are EVs, and red is non-EVs, right? So you see it's a reverse, right? So the electric vehicle, um, sales in Europe are very much uh, skyrocketing. And so that's why you see Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the, State of the EU speech uh, declare that it is uh, the future of our clean tech industry has to be made in Europe. So the surging of economic nationalism. Will this subsidy probe um, end up being very damaging to German-US relations and EU uh, China relations, sorry, Germany-China relations and EU-China relations. I think it all, there's a huge internal coordination uh, challenge that has to be overcome, right? And this was a strategy that China uh, played to great effect uh, back in 2013 when there was a solar panel fight, right? So, so uh, uh, China was able to just divide and conquer by looking at key um, uh, export dependencies that different <coughs> EU countries had with China and tariff those goods and basically um, reduce the, inter the coordinated capacity of the EU. That was back in 2013. Um, there are distributional issues that have to be overcome today as well because the German automotive industry is heavily, heavily in uh, invested in China, unlike the French uh, industry, right? So if China chooses to retaliate, uh, against the subsidies, um, subsidy probe, right? It will most likely look to German auto manufacturers and they will face the brunt uh, of the retaliation. So that graph just so shows you, if you look at the red line, it shows you that 70% of German FDI into China is, comes from the automotive trade. Of course, if the retaliation happens, that will only serve to chill foreign investment uh, sentiments in China. So it might fuel an economic slowdown nevertheless. Um, with this new f economic securitization, right, so the question I'm pondering now is will it allow the EU to overcome these internal distribution issues and internal coordination issues that have previously, if we look at previous cases, hobbled its efforts to put together a coherent trade policy towards China. So let me conclude. Um, What's been instructive for me in putting this uh, uh, set of comments together is that many of the normal types of um, ana analytical tools that we reach for when we think about things like excess capacity and trade policy uh, conflicts, many of the interest group politics are very muted once we bring into consideration the securitization of the various economies and the securitization of the overall bilateral relationships between these economies. But let's not, let's not forget that there's going to be a feedback effect back into China that actually makes things worse, right? Because China also does not view these trade policy um, these trade policies as merely trade policies. China also is viewing these trade policies through the lens of economic security and through, in particular, through the narrative of, of containment, right? Because many of these um, export restrictions are on the very same technologies and the very same goods that China sees as vital to its future development. 
Um, so what's concerning here, if we think about China's economic slowdown and the ramifications on the world economy, is that it can fuel um, what's already been um, a dangerous sort of back and forth of, of securitization. Um, there are also ways in which European and U.S. policies are complicated by the slowdown, right? Because of the American tariffs, right? If, if, the, if Chinese excess capacity does not go into the American market, it must go somewhere else, right? So we increasingly, we see sources of tension between Europe and the U.S. over this question of how do you um, tackle a common China uh, challenge, right? It's the same type of frustration that we saw European governments express when the IRA was um, was passed into law, because the subsidy competition has the potential of just dragging all these major economies into very serious debt problems. So coordination over China policy will be a big pro um, a big challenge as well. So with that, I thank you very much. Great. I was unwilling to enforce time because I thought it was so amazing she was able to give the amazing coherent comments without the visual cues that she had expected. Um, but terrific. Um, and so I think because we'll get we'll take some time to get Andy's PowerPoint set up. And so next we'll go to Hong Zhang, who's currently at HKS and soon to be joining University of Indiana Bloomington as an assistant professor in the fall. So the view from the developing world, I think, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you, Meg. And just stay seated, please. Yeah. Since I'm going to uh, read my notes. Um, so yeah, actually, it's, uh, it's wonderful to follow Yelling. Yeah, it's hard to follow Yelling, but um, it's good that I'm, I'm coming from a different angle because I'm going to cover the, the poorer countries since you will cover the rich countries. And I'm also going to provide my perspective on this topic of our panel, the implication of China's economic slowdown. Thank you. Sorry. On um, the China's foreign relations. Um, so I'm going to draw on my research on China's development engagement with the global south, especially in the infrastructure sector, to pr provide some perspectives on this question. Um, to start, I think it's really helpful to, to refer to the article that Meg mentioned in, in the beginning by, um, by, by Michael Beckley that was published on International Security. Uh, that's titled The Perils of Peking Power. So I, I find it really useful for me to organize some of my thoughts and anchor this, the discussion. So Beckley argues that, for those who haven't read the article, um, he argues that the rising powers who experience economic slowdown, or what he calls uh, peaking powers, are likely to expand more ex aggressively than when their economy was rapidly growing, due to the fear that the good days may be over soon. And he argues that the peaking power tend to engage in mercantilist expansion. Uh, which refers to measures that restrict foreign assets to their domestic markets while investing heavily overseas to generate demand for their exports and secure critical resources. And furthermore, if a peaking power is authoritarian regime and faces less de desirable prospects for trade, the tendency um, for it to adopt mercantilist expansion would be even stronger. So to Beckley, um, China is clearly moving in this direction, as evidenced by China's rapid expansion of overseas economic presence and military outreach. So in the remainder of my time, I would like to discuss whether, in the face of economic slowdown at home, which I'm not debating, I think that's the, tr the true, the, the fact that China's economy is slowing down at home, um, whether in, uh, in this situation China is becoming more mercantilist uh, with regard specifically to its relations with the Global South countries. And I do recognize that Global South is a very contentious uh, concept, um, but here I use it just as a shorthand to refer to middle and low-income countries in uh, Asia, Africa, South America, and, or even parts of Europe. And, and these countries do not quite identify with the current international order that's centered on rules made in North America and Europe. And by do, using such a framing of the concept of global south, I also want to remind us that when we discuss China's foreign relations, there's agency on the part of its counterparts, which I think that's something that Enzo also touched upon in the previous panel. And so the extent to which China's economic engagement is accommodated or resisted often depends more on the host country's agenda than China's own. So now let me start by saying that I, I do agree with Beckley's uh, description of China's mercantilist expansion when it comes to China's infrastructure exports in the global south. 
after all, the Belt and Road Initiative is best known for its push for infrastructure development. And I specifically use this term infrastructure export to highlight the fact that China's engagement in major in infrastructure projects across Global South is essentially part of its export-oriented development strategy. Ever since the 1980s, China has recognized the value of overseas construction contracting as an important sector for its export. So in the 80s and 90s, uh, it was more about exporting China's construction labor. Um, but it, since the 2000s, the focus gradually uh, shifted towards exporting China's capital goods, such as machinery and equipment. And nowadays, there's great push for exporting China's technical standards and engineering and design expertise. And such an evolution reflects China's relentless drive uh, to achieve industrial upgrading and a command height in the global infrastructure market, which ob obviously is, is a sector with um, great strategic, strategic values. And, and there's also clearly huge unmet demand, especially in the global south. And such an approach is mercantilist because it seeks to maximize China's export with potentially detrimental effects on the host country's own industrial capacity. Uh, and, and China's construction companies continuous reliance on bringing labor from China, a, a practice that still uh, exists today, um, even though nowadays to a lesser extent than before, that remains a major point of contention. In many of the global South countries, already with rampant corruption and chronic capitalism, the market-seeking Chinese companies often collude with host country elites in obtaining op contracts. So in short, China's infrastructure project has been marked by a single-minded concern with growing Chinese companies' uh, market shares and a failure to recognize how such behaviors potentially undermine the host country's governance and long-term development. This is the greatest problem with China's global infrastructure push and why it deserves a negative connotation of mercantilism. And central to China's mercantilist expansion in the infrastructure sector is its willingness to provide financing to major, uh, for major infrastructure projects overseas, typically as loans provided to the host governments, uh, again, primarily driven by its own interest of promoting infrastructure exports rather than by the concern for the host country's developmental needs. In fact, Chinese companies and financial institutions have always been quite frank when they uh, refer to these financings. They describe them as export credits, no, nothing more, no, nothing less. However, it is in the context of the Global South country's complaint about the traditional donors shying away from infrastructure financing, ignoring their very real developmental needs, that such financing from China <coughs> began to be framed as so-called development finance and China begins to be seen as the so-called emerging donor, challenging the do dominance of traditional international development actors. And this also means that China's mercantilist expansion in infrastructure export is based on the methods of inducement <coughs> rather than coercion. To every Chinese-built white elephant project in the global south, there is a host country elite in a position of brokering large infrastructure, infrastructure deals who is eager to use such projects to score product critical credit or to patronize their constituency. And the notorious uh, Hanban Tota port well illustrates this point as Max's research has shown. In many cases, China's uh, infrastructure offering is indeed motivated by gaining access to natural resources as seen in the countries such as Angola or Venezuela. And, but even there, the nature of engagement is inducement and collusion rather than coercion. So in this sense, China's mercantilism has refrained, as, refrained as, at least so far, from going to the extreme scenario of conquest by force, as suggested in Beckley's paper. And there has been, of course, a lot of controversy with regard to whether China's loans in these countries led to so-called debt trap, and whether China intends to seize strategic assets when these countries fail to repay their debts. But so far, there has been no evidence of such attempts from China and on the contrary, to many countries currently in trouble of repaying their debts to China, such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, Zambia, China has agreed to restructure debts, or is rolling over the old debts with new loans. And while we have heard accusations from Washington about China's dragging feet in G20's common framework negotiations to restructure debts for these countries, such, such a reluctance on China's part 
stems more from its distrust from the Bretton Wood, of the Bretton Woods institutions rather than China's desire to pressure the debtor, debtor countries. Now, does the domestic economic slowdown mean that China is less able to provide financing for overseas infrastructure projects, and therefore China is losing its capacity to continue its mercantilist expansion in this sector? Indeed, as many data collection uh, efforts on China's overseas financing have observed, China's overseas lending to Africa and Latin America has plummeted in recent years. And, but this, however, um, reflects more of the country's reduced room for borrow borrowing rather than China's capacity for overseas financing. Based on uh, People's Bank of China's data, China's overseas loans have been around 2-3% to, to of the entire lending profile of its financial sector which suggests that there is still room for expansion in terms of overseas loans. And perhaps particularly so in current circumstances given the ongoing deleveraging of China's, in China's domestic economy, Chinese financial institutions might be facing an asset shortage at home and may instead be more motivated to seek opportunities abroad. A notable new policy was that in January 2022, the Central Bank, uh, China, the People, People's Bank of China, started to allow Chinese banks to lend RMB loans to all kinds of overseas borrowers, uh, and not unlike it previously, it was just limited to Chinese companies going abroad. And because of the interest rate hikes in, in the US and Europe in recent years, for the first time in the past decade, uh, the RMB loans financing costs may be lower than do dollar or euro loans which makes it more attractive, perhaps, for some foreign borrowers to borrow the RMB loans. So we'll see if this will lead to a significant increase of Chinese overseas um, RMB loans. And more fundamentally, China's push for infrastructure export is unlikely to cede, even if the traditional approach based on lending to foreign governments may no longer be viable. A new trend we are observing now is that China's construction companies are increasingly seeking to participate in so-called public-private partnership projects overseas. And so unlike in the past where a Chinese company, um, uh, where China lent to host, co government, host country governments to hire Chinese companies for the construction, nowadays the Chinese companies become the equity investors in the special purpose vehicles set up to develop infrastructure projects. And the Chinese companies have been encouraging this new model for several reasons. First, it, it bypassed the need for the host government to borrow directly. And, and second, it in incentivizes the Chinese companies to be more selective in their participation in, in the kind of infrastructure projects they participate in because they now have a skin of the game for the project's long-term um, viability. And third, by becoming the equity investor or owner, it will be easier uh, for the Chinese actors to push for the adoption of uh, Chinese technical standards and source a greater proportion of the inputs from China. So in short, China's mercantilist expansion for infrastructure export is likely to continue, but now in a more sophisticated form. And I'll conclude by referring back to Beckley's argument that peaking power's tendency of aggressive mercantilist expansion is particularly strong when they believe that their prospects for trade are grim. But if we, they believe that um, they have a good chance of growing their exports, they might opt for a more liberal approach of expansion, including by opening up uh, to free trade and investment and letting private actors take a lead in generating national wealth and, and power. So let's look at China's trade. Um, based on Chinese official statistics, trade with countries along the original 64 Belt and Road countries increased from $1 trillion in 2013 to over trillion, $2 trillion, so doubled in, in 10 years of BRI. And so these, these, these suggest that China's perception of its trade prospects, um, at least with the global south, might not be that pessimistic. In fact, there are signs that China is adopting some measures not, that may fit into Beckley's definition of liberal expansion versus the mercantilist expansion. We see that China has concluded free trade agreements with ASEAN, uh, that was earlier, and uh, as well as 18 other so-called Belt and Road countries, including countries like Pakistan, Georgia, Chile, Ecuador, Serbia, Peru, Costa Rica, Nicar Nicaragua. And China also hosted six import expos since 2018. So those of you who know the Canton Fair that's been very uh, significant, very crucial for China's export-oriented strategy in, in the reform and opening up era. This new expo that's focusing on import 
uh, in other words, inviting countries to come to China and, and show the Chinese customers what they have to offer, is another thing, another in, um, innovation um, in the era of BRI. Um, so China also, um, it just, just for example, the last year, the last ex import export um, in 2013, the five spotlight guest countries are the Honduras, Kazakhstan, Serbia, South Africa, and Vietnam. So by yeah, bringing this fact to the, yeah, at the end of my presentation, I just want to show that the, the picture is quite mixed in terms of what China is doing in response to the economic slowdown at home. So it's a mix of more, the continuous mercantilist, mercantilist approach in the infrastructure sector, but more sophisticated, as well as, in a way, more liberal approach in terms of opening up trade with a lot of countries from the global south. So I'll end here, and you know, I'll look forward to this discussion later. Thank you. I find the idea of special financing vehicles going global a bit problematic given what's happened in China's domestic economy. It sounds very similar, actually, to local government financing vehicles, but I'll leave that out of it. Um, last but not least, Andy Kennedy from Australian National University. Thanks. The title of my talk is uh, Tortoise uh, and Dragon, uh, Slowing Growth and Guided Innovation uh, in China. Um, uh, and uh, as I think, I hope the uh, title implies, uh, I think there are multiple uh, trends in China's economy that have, uh, that we need to think about and that have important implications uh, for its foreign relations. Uh, first, as we've been talking about, China's economic growth uh, is slowing down, um, <clears throat> uh, and that's a process that's been underway uh, for some time. Just how much China's economy is slowing, of course, is, uh, is unclear. Um, some see China continuing to grow at between 3.5 and 4%, uh, perhaps even faster, uh, out to 2050, to mid-century. Um, in contrast, uh, others are more pessimistic. Uh, scholars at the Lowy Institute in Australia and the Australian Nas National University, uh, where I'm from, um, argue that these kinds of um, projections uh, are too optimistic about productivity growth uh, in China, uh, and they uh, expect that China will actually slow to around 3% by 2030 and around 2% uh, by 2040. Um, though they acknowledge that China could grow as fast as 5% if it adopts productivity enhancing reforms. Uh, these are very different geopolitical futures. Uh, if China manages to grow between 4 and 5% per year out to 20, 2050, uh, it will become easily the largest economy uh, in the world. Uh, but if it's closer to 2 or 3%, uh, it's it will still surpass the United States, uh, but not by that much. Uh, and its per capita GDP uh, will be substantially lower uh, than that you see in, uh, in the U.S. <clears throat> um, a second key trend is that China is conducting a massive experiment with what I call uh, guided innovation uh, in pursuit of greater technological self-reliance. Uh, I want to say more about this uh, second trend in particular because it's intertwined with the first trend uh, and it's important that we keep both of these trends in mind as we think about China's relations with the outside world. <clears throat> okay, so I want to start by saying just a little bit more about what guided innovation is. Uh, in essence, guided innovation is rooted in the concept of the national innovation system, uh, the idea that a given economy consists of a range of actors, uh, governments, firms, universities, uh, financiers, end users, uh, that are intertwined with each other in relationships that drive innovation forward. Um, in guided innovation, the state not only supports the innovation system, but also tries to steer it in keeping with national priorities. Uh, every government does this to some degree, uh, of course, uh, but what we've seen uh, develop in China is really quite striking and remarkable. Uh, China began consciously grappling with the innovation concept uh, back in the 1990s, uh, and then interest really deepened in the 2000s, and it became quite apparent. Uh, in 2006, the Medium Long-Term Program for Science and Technology Development, uh, or MLP, um, <clears throat> declared that China should uh, develop a national innovation system uh, with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and it said this system should be guided by government, uh, even as it allowed um, for market allocation of resources. <clears throat> uh, under Xi Jinping, the party state's pursuit of guided innovation has clearly reached uh, new heights. Uh, the mid-2010s uh, saw the, the uh, rollout of new initiatives like Made in China 2025 and the Artificial Intelligence uh, Action Plan under the umbrella of the Innovation Driven Development Strategy. Uh, more recently, uh, China's pursuit of guided innovation and technological self-reliance 
has clearly intensified as the uh, quote unquote tech war with the United States uh, and other countries has deepened. Um, whoops. I want to highlight uh, just a couple examples of this to make this discussion uh, less abstract uh, and more concrete. Um, to give one prominent example, the Chinese government has not only, not only sought to, venture, uh, to develop venture capital uh, in China, uh, but also fostered a large number of what are called government-guided funds, or GGFs. Uh, these are funds set up by central and local governments uh, in China in pursuit of particular developmental priorities. Um, often a professional managing agency is designated to operate the fund, but they are evaluated with regard to their compliance with policy goals. Uh, by the end of 2022, there were more than 2,000 uh, of these funds uh, in China. Uh, the collective target size of these funds uh, was nearly 13 trillion renminbi, uh, of which about 6.5 trillion renminbi, about half, uh, had actually been raised. Um, <clears throat> Um, that's, that's quite a large figure. It was about 5% of China's, China's official GDP uh, output for that year. Um, uh, these funds are one way in which China is pursuing greater technological self-reliance, uh, as they're typically focused on some kind of high-tech priority. Uh, the so-called Big Fund, founded in 2014, of course, uh, very well known for promoting uh, or supporting China's pursuit of semiconductor technology. <clears throat> Um, the new funds also complicate efforts to generate economic growth, however. Uh, for one thing, they're not very active. Um, uh, uh, recent research on the promise and pitfalls of uh, government-guided funds published in the China Quarterly found that by 2021, uh, only 34 percent of the funds had actually made an investment uh, in a sub-fund or in a company. Uh, so around two-thirds of the existing funds really hadn't done anything yet. <clears throat> Um, in many cases, especially in less developed parts of the country, there simply aren't suitable investment opportunities for these funds to take advantage of. Um, another problem is that these funds are sometimes abandoned by local officials uh, when they move on uh, to, to other positions. Uh, and when they do invest, the question remains whether the investment was the most productive use of capital. Uh, more recently, China has promoted knowledge sharing and collaboration in the innovation system through the development uh, of what are called innovation consortia. Uh, these have been organized at various levels of the political system uh, to pursue a wide range of technological priorities. Uh, and they're typically led by a single actor, uh, often a state-owned state enterprise or a research institute. Uh, membership in the consortia can include not only firms and research institutes, but also universities uh, and national labs and other actors uh, in the innovation system. <clears throat> um, they're typically linked by contractual arrangements that specify the particular rewards uh, and evaluation criteria for different uh, members of, of the consortia. <clears throat> the number of these consortia appears to be growing uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, a number of provinces uh, have set targets for 2025, uh, as you can see on the screen here. Um, these are pretty um, pragmatic targets. A lot of times they say about this many or at least this many. Um, for Zhejiang in particular, they're provincial level uh, consortia. Um, so they're, they're sort of uh, works in progress, but nonetheless, they're, they're clearly setting, um, uh, setting their sights on, on making, uh, making a difference here. Uh, overall, uh, Barry Naughton estimates that there are already hundreds of active consortia in China uh, today. Um, Naughton has also warned that the effort to use these consortia to reduce reliance on foreign technology will impose very significant economic costs on China, particularly as Chinese alternatives, um, uh, Chinese alternatives that are merely adequate are replaced, um, uh, uh, replace higher quality products uh, from abroad. <clears throat> so what does all this mean for China's foreign relations? Uh, well, I want to start here by emphasizing the important strategic implications of economic interdependence between China and the outside world, uh, particularly the United States. Um, as Tom Christensen has recently argued in the article Mutually Assured uh, Disruption, which he touched on uh, in his talk yesterday, uh, economic interdependence has been a force for peace in East Asia for several decades, uh, making military conflict considerably more costly than it would otherwise be. It's also an important means through which the United States can influence China, <clears throat> uh, and that's been on display as the war in Ukraine has unfolded. In this context, it's important to note that slower growth in China 
has been presented as undermining interdependence and promoting decoupling even without government action to promote such outcomes. <clears throat> and in particular, uh, as Dan Rosen has written in Foreign Affairs, uh, in recent years, strategists in democratic countries have looked for ways to discourage their firms from going to China or to put pressure on those already there to leave. And then he adds, Western authorities don't need to command firms to curtail their China ambitions. Transparency about the extent of China's macro macroeconomic stress will do that job naturally. And elective decoupling is taking place even without maximum arm twisting. Uh, of course, foreign companies in China are, are not simply worried about economic growth. Um, they have uh, other, other issues there as well. Uh, but if Rosen's right, uh, China's economic slowdown has some worrying implications uh, for economic interdependence and for efforts to maintain peace in East Asia. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, it's important to keep in mind that slower growth will have other effects uh, as well. Uh, and um, uh, Yeling and Hong have already been talking uh, about some of the effects uh, that it can have. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, how the slowdown affects uh, the party states experiment with guided innovation uh, in particular. <clears throat> um, other, things, uh, other things being equal, uh, the effect on guided innovation and the pursuit of technological self-reliance uh, should be negative. First, uh, slower growth means less government revenue to spend on science and technology. Uh, China's universities and research institutes are heavily reliant uh, on government funding, and as the Rhodium Group has recently argued, uh, that funding is likely to come under pressure uh, in the years to come, especially at the local level. <clears throat> Tax incentives that encourage firms to conduct R&D uh, could come under pressure uh, as well. Slower growth also means less revenue for Chinese firms uh, in the domestic market uh, and greater constraints uh, on their R&D spending. And sentiment in China's tech sector is already fairly downcast given the pressure it's been under uh, in recent years. Uh, in January 2020, for example, uh, China had 28% of the world's unicorns, startup companies worth at least $1 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, by October of last year, that number was down to 17%, uh, a drop of 11%. Slower growth also makes it more difficult to compete for top-tier high-tech talent, which has been a long-standing challenge in China. According to the think tank Macro Polo, the U.S. had 57% of the world's most elite artificial intelligence researchers in 2022, whereas China had, 20, uh, China had tw just 12%, uh, even though the country, China was the country of origin for 26% uh, of those researchers. Of course, China has the resources to do many, uh, impressive, uh, many impressive things uh, in the high-tech space in the years to come, and I have no doubt uh, that they will. My point here is simply that slowing growth will have a negative impact uh, on the drive for greater uh, technological self-reliance, other things being equal. In this way, slowing growth could actually foster interdependence between the outside world and China, uh, because China will continue to need foreign technology more than it otherwise would. Overall, then, slower growth may have an ambiguous impact on China's interdependence with the outside world going forward. In some ways, it may foster decoupling, uh, but in others, it could undermine the drive for greater technological separation. Thank you. All right, well, we have 30 minutes for question and answer, and so if you'll just signal to me, then I'll call on you, but I guess I'll take my prerogative as the, as the, the, the chair of the session um, to ask, to ask for each of your views on a relatively broad question, um, which is, um, it, we've seen in recent years, and certainly I've, I've made this argument, and many of us, I think, have made this argument in different ways, which is that what we see under Xi Jinping is a, a turn from, as Yelling said in the beginning of her talk, um, a, an approach to GDP growth and anything else is possible as long as practically we're getting economic growth to security, even if you're willing to sacrifice some economic growth. And my question is that that seems like a reasonable thing um, until we're looking at you know extremely slow growth. And so you know it, it, no, I think no one would argue that China isn't experiencing a slowdown. And indeed, as many people have emphasized, and it's always important to emphasize, very few countries sustain double-digit growth for many generations. And so it's not unusual or even cataclysmic for China to be growing at three percent or four percent, even two percent. On the other hand, 
China has a lot further to go um, in terms of developing than many countries that do grow at that rate. Um, and also, it's entirely possible that China's growth rate might be closer to 0% or negative, um, given how limited the data that we have um, and, and various debates about what exactly that looks like. And more importantly, it's driven, I think we all kind of agree, not only by the structural transition, the demographic transition, and some policy channel things, but also it seems like an expectations crisis um, that's reflected in consumer confidence, um, low investment uh, to GDP from the private sector. Um, and various social phenomenon that we've all been interested in, like lying flat, et cetera, um, and youth unemployment. And so in that sense, there's a kind of political element to China's, a domestic political element to China's crisis um, or stagnation or situation, as I inelegantly said at the very beginning. Um, and so it's interesting because each of the things that you all spoke about are relevant to how that might refract through Chinese domestic politics and then, of course, influence its foreign policy. And so in a world in which Chinese citizens know that their domestic economy is doing poorly, but as Hong argued, they're willing to bail out countries that maybe aren't so responsible with their fiscal policies, like Pakistan, I'm comfortable saying. Um, will that be something that Chinese citizens seem to care about? Is that going to be seen as a legitimate foreign policy type behavior? Andy, I think similarly, that was something you're interested in. Can they continue? I mean, their industrial policies almost are built in to, uh, to, uh, to basically incur a lot of waste. It's much more tolerable in the Chinese system than it would be where every tax dollar that goes to an electric vehicle company that declares bankruptcy in the United States is some expose here, whereas it's not necessarily the case in China and they expect that kind of waste. And so will they tolerate that? Um, and then, yeah, Ling, in China's relations with the rest of the world, um, yes, you know, you said, you know, part of the, the line has been that, you know, part of China's slowdown is the containment, you forgot suppression, but containment and suppression of the Chinese economy. Um, and is it your view that people in China will buy that? Because the necessary, you know, follow on to that is we're being contained and therefore we must fight aggressively, whereas a more beneficial <laughs> long-term strategy may be to come to some agreements, particularly with the European Union, about voluntary export restraints or you know, various ways in which they can pursue those markets. And so um, so I, I'm wondering about the domestic Chinese political ramifications of the slowdown and how it might affect their behavior in the world. If you could just say something briefly about it, and then we'll open it up. <coughs> Maybe I'll, I'll start with Hong. Um, yeah, yeah, make this question about whether what the Chinese um, um, citizens are reacting to China's, uh, the perceived Chinese citizens are dress in the Belt and Road countries. Um, and that's always been a very controversial topic. Um, and I mean, but also I think there's not, there's a very, very low level of understanding among Chinese citizens also in terms of nature of Chinese financing overseas. Uh, because people are very stuck in the impression of the Mao era foreign aid, which was highly irrational. Um, in the 60s and 70s when China was um, providing foreign aid to, especially to African countries. And that was the aid that was really at the expense of, of Chinese citizens' consumption needs. So a lot of these, for example, the, the railway, the Tanzania Zambia Railway, uh, that was built um, <coughs> with the, the kind of the steels and the materials that was badly needed and in China itself. But in order to you know, build the relations with these countries that are perceived to be very, uh, that would be very helpful for China diplomatically, um, really the, the foreign aid system at that time was really mobilizing all these resources, um, prioritizing the supply of the materials to foreign aid projects at the expense of domestic um, needs. So I think Chinese um, people have very um, tra traumatized memories of, about that period, and so al also that carries on to the era of Belt and Road. Like uh, there's, uh, if when there was still, um, you see some of those uncensored <coughs> online commentaries. Um, there's a little resentment in terms of you know how chi how come China's building all these uh, different projects. Um, in, in uh, remote areas of the world when uh, a lot of um, villagers in China still are in need of schools and hospitals and things like that. But also, at the same time, I, I do think that um, like the, the reason why I want to frame this China's export, um, infrastructure export as mercantilist, really a lot of this financing is not aid, it's not free money. They are, these, these loans are provided to foreign countries to buy Chinese products and Chinese services and so at the end of the day, it's, it's benefiting Chinese economy more than um, the local economy in, in, in a way, even though the project in, is being built in that country. So that kind of sentiment, I think, still 
both on. Um, and, and, but overall, like I said, Chinese overseas loans is still a tiny fraction of its, um, compared to its domestic lending. Um, so in that sense, um, even if all these countries are going to default on China, it's not, um, in terms of its impact on domestic probably it's not going to be that big. Um, of course, politically, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be pleasant at all, even for an authoritarian government um, to, to reveal to its citizens that it's kind of all these monies are wa is waste, wasted. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why a lot, for a lot of these debt renegotiation with developing countries, it's, it's kind of hard because nobody wants to take responsibility for having made a decision years before of um, giving this loan to a, a project uh, or to a country that's not going to be able to repay it. Um, so at the end of the day, all of these decisions have to be made at very high level politically uh, to allow this process of debt restructuring to go go forward. And, and because the top leader is not doesn't that have really that much time to make all these decisions, that's why a lot of the negotiation uh, debt re renegotiation um, is dragging feet. Um, and so that's um, yeah, creating problems for China's relations with these other countries as well. So yeah, I think that's just what all I have to say about this, um, this issue. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe Andy, I'll ask you. I mean, it seems very interesting. You said, you concluded that if they don't have enough money to finance their domestic innovation system, then they're going to be forced to rely on foreign technology. But of course, they can't anymore, right? Because it's precisely the areas, the sectors, AI, biotech, the semiconductors, quantum computing, in which they wanted to have domestic innovation that have been foreclosed, at least through some pathways. And so, are you predicting a return to a more conciliatory behavior that would pursue uh, some pathway, reverse pathway from U.S. restrictions on China's involvement in the innovation ecosystem in those in the global sector. Is that is that the argument that you would be making? Well, not necessarily. Um, I, I think I'm just saying that uh, less money uh, means less capacity to invest mm -hmm. in particular priorities. Um, they're still going to invest a lot of money, yeah. just um, on you know that they will have do it to somewhat less degree than they otherwise would. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will probably be focused on you know, particular priorities, and especially the ones that you've just, just been talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, they're still going to do it. Um, they will just have less capacity uh, to do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it's important to keep in mind that the, the pursuit of uh, self-reliance is not just in you know, semiconductors and uh, clean energy and a few sort of high-level priorities. It's really quite wide-ranging. Mm -hmm. um, and you get um, you know, these innovation consortia and, 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 and the guidance funds set up at levels throughout the political system. And it's not all just one sort of central playbook um, directing this. It's, it's a nationwide thing. And so you have a lot of different things going on. Um, not all of that is going to be viable. There's not going to be money to support all of that um, necessarily in the future if they you know, continue to grow relatively slowly. That's, mm -hmm. that's my point. Okay, great. And Yerling, how would it look, economic crisis in China, um, if we thought the growth is actually 0%? Say it just stays 0% for the next three years. In EVs, it may be 30%. But the robots make the EVs, not the people. <laughs> so what would that mean, you know, if then even the bright spots of the Chinese economy are receiving a bunch of restrictions from the United States and potentially Europe, how does that look in terms of China's policy toward other countries in the developed world? Do you, would you predict more, con, uh, more of a conciliatory posture or something, I don't want to say aggressive because I don't mean militarily aggressive, but you know, coming to terms with, with the European Union and the US on some trade issues or refusal to do so? From China? Yeah. I mean, I, I do think the policies, the foreign economic policies um, have been quite conciliatory mm -hmm. in recent <coughs> years, um, including to with with American CEOs, you know, from the San Francisco summit and so on. Right, I, I think there's an ongoing um, effort to change the narrative, to and 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 it feeds into I think a little bit of cognitive dissonance, right? Where domestically you have messaging. Um, from the Chinese government that there's containment and suppression going on, but at places like Davos and in meetings with foreign leaders, um, especially with Europe, 
uh, and with countries like uh, with Ireland, with UK, uh, a much more positive set of, of messages. Um, I say it's mixed messages because one part of the Chinese government is saying we welcome foreign investment, China will continue to uh, you know, engage in trade agreements, China has agreed to sign on, um, has, has um, asked to join the CPTPP and so on. And then you have another set of messages that are about uh, securitization, right? You also have a, a slew of legislation that's about data security, and that's slowly, you know, what that means is still uh, going through this very slow and painful process of clarification. Uh, you have the MSS, you know, putting messages out to society to be um, wary of, of espionage, and you have the crackdowns on the consulting company. So it adds up to what I think is a very confusing situation for private investors, both domestic and, and foreign. And I think that partly <coughs> stems from the problem that no one really knows what it means to coordinate development and security. If you're a security agency, right, it means one thing. If you're a development agency, it means another thing. And they compete with each other to try to define the actual substance of the policy. And if you add to that another um, trend is that centralization of policy control, which I think has bred a lot of risk aversion within the system. And so I think, I think domestically the Chinese economy, um, I think domestically Chinese policy making is increasingly uh, incapable of calibration, right? And, and rather there's so much risk aversion in, in the system that when the signal comes from the top to do something, then you have campaign style um, rectification and, and, and desire to signal, yes, we're loyal to the campaign. And then it takes you know, days and months to try and walk back the negative effects, right? So the technology crackdown, the platform economy crackdown is, is a case in point. So if you have these kinds of mixed signals going out, they're happening um, in foreign policy as well, because the two, the two realms, the domestic and international realms, are not distinct. Right? Foreign policy makers are reading news about what's happening within China as well. So I think it's, it's, there's a credibility gap in terms of what the Chinese government is trying to assure, mm -hmm. and then an, ex, you know, an ever widening set of questions about what exactly is happening with the Chinese economy, where is the data, um, what is the actual level of youth unemployment, and what, uh, what is the overarching um, uh, guidance for the economy? Very well said. Okay, I see a number of hands up. Maybe Tom first, and then just signal. Thanks, to Meg, and thanks for doing this, Meg. I appreciate it. Um, my question uh, is really for Yelling first, but it's, it's uh, the statement that uh, first of all, I was surprised by the uh, current account surplus figures that you offered because I remember the days of high current account surpluses, and I think 2006 was the peak, 8% um, of GDP, which is really stunning. Um, uh, so if we return to that, then the question is, does the U.S. consumer benefit from China's uh, export push? Um, you had raised that issue. Uh, the tariffs would suggest otherwise, but it seems to me that uh, China has increased its trade markedly in intermediate goods to Vietnam and to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And those countries have uh, increased their exports to the United States massively. And that's why the U.S. trade deficit with the world or the U.S. current account deficit is at record levels. Um, so I'm not so sure that the U.S. consumer is not benefiting from cheaper products because of the push, it's just not coming with a made in China stamp on it. Um, and whether that will last through the US election, I don't know, because um, that, you know, the, the trade implications uh, are, are pretty clear. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that. I, I have another question, but I'll, maybe I'll just ask that, that question uh, uh, later. Thanks. We will collect one. Is that all right, Dan? Yeah, sure. We'll just up to you. A couple more. So yeah. Mitch, and then up here on the top left, and we'll go to the yeah, right. Hi, uh, Mitch Presnick, visiting fellow at the Fairbank Center. Thank you so much for today. Um, I had a question, sort of looking at the future. Um, Ceteris paribus. Let's assume that uh, China's slowdown is 
caused by one or the other of these two potential uh, rationale. And let's assume that it's irrelevant for the purpose of what we do in the future about it. The fact is, uh, Eric Lee uh, just announced at the uh, FCC in Hong Kong like two, days, two, three days ago that not only is China now a larger manufacturing base than the US, Japan, and Germany combined, it's now added India to that. That all within the last year. Uh, China's uh, uh, autos have surged 30% year on year just in the last two months. Um, and they're already their stated OFDI is 1.2 trillion through 2028. So let's let's sidestep the economic growth, whether it's true or not or whatever. But let's get to the idea that these numbers are confirmable. So the question is, what can we do as a Western uh, business base <coughs> to counter that? Are there are there any examples that you guys have of of public-private partnerships that are working particularly well in some part of the EU or something that we on in uh, within the U.S. policy environment that could be helpful because we have to assume that uh, what China is doing on BRI and investment in infrastructure, it is hand in glove with creating new export markets which will then sop up some of that excess capacity that they're creating. What if, what if they're actually um, crazy like a fox? Um, they've been right about a lot of things up until now. What if that's going to continue to be the case and what are we doing about that? That's the question I was going to ask. Thank you. We get one more up here. Yep. Okay, I'm supposed to identify myself. Um, Todd Hall, University of Oxford. Uh, great panel, a wonderful watching. Um, so I guess my question is basically a variation on Tom's question in many ways, is, is, the un, is the consequences of some of these measures and the unintended, and I think back to Enza Hun's um, is statement too about the unintentional effects and unintentional influences, because it would seem in some ways that how much are, for example, Chinese firms now just taking a plus one strategy and moving certain things ab abroad, and what does that then mean, for example, for, for the ways in which if we for rerouting supply chains through Mexico and Vietnam, what does that then also mean for Chinese influence in those countries? And, and are there other possible unintended consequences of Chinese firms or the Chinese government dealing with these issues that might not have been expected as the outcome of these, of these measures? Thank you. Thanks. So three big questions. <laughs> so I, I, I entirely agree with um, Tom, your comment that there is a lot of um, tariff evasion going on. It's hard, I don't know figures of how much of the tariff evasion has, has compensated for, you know, is it a, is it a full one-on-one -on -one substitution or is it just one-third? of imports that would have otherwise gone into the U.S. is now entering through Mexico or through, through Vietnam. It, it's, not, it's not evasion. It's rerouting. Ter yeah, trade so, diversion. So, yeah. But it's, not, it's not just taking a final Chinese product and stamping it in Vietnam. It's, it's, it's sending all the parts for the Vietnamese product, having it assembled in a, in a, in a, in a facility in, in Vietnam, and then sent for the made in Vietnam. And the, the value added of the Chinese inputs are, are very high. So it's still a high percentage of the total price. And that's why <coughs> the trade deficit with Vietnam in the last few years, the United States trade deficit with Vietnam, is constantly mm -hmm. And Me Mexico has become the biggest exporter of manufactured goods. Sorry, manufactured goods in the United States. And a big part of that is the huge increase in Chinese exports to Mexico and the huge increase and Chinese exports to Vietnam. And I'm sure that's just two examples. They're the prime examples that come up. But I'm sure there are lots of other countries where Chinese intermediate goods are being exported. I think China's been very clever in getting around the Trump level, Trump era tariffs. Um, and that might help explain that really shocking figure that you have that we've returned to. Uh, mm -hmm. The first decade of this century level current account surpluses, which is going to have implications about China's uh, valuation of RMB as well, mm -hmm. um, which means it's, the, the RMB is undervalued. Yeah, and I think that's why you if see... 8% of GDP is undervalued. It's not at 8%, though. It's about half of that. So it's okay, at so 2009 levels. Oh, 2009, not, yeah. not 2006 Not 2006 levels. levels. But it's still, 
um, it hasn't been as high. It has not. As not it hasn't been as high as since 2009, which is yeah, worrisome yeah. still, right? Um, and I think I think this um, the 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 shifting of supply chains out of China into Vietnam and and so on is precisely why you see American trade officials talking about the the need to revisit rules of origins. Um, clauses and trade agreements and the need to revisit the US MPCA because it's it's like a game of whack-a-mole, right? So you levy a set of tariffs, you know, firms adjust and then American officials become concerned and they say, well, what can we do to chase so, so that? You're gonna chase that right? yeah. so, so this has an impact for the green technology sector that was raised by all of you and, and that has to do with uh, batteries and electrical systems for, e for EVs. So I was in Korea two weeks ago and they're really concerned that this whack-a-mole approach by the United States is going to prevent them from selling Korean EVs. I'll just speak loudly. Um, Korean EVs uh, to uh, to the United States because there's going to be too much Chinese content in them. Right now, that's not a design to get around the tariffs. That's just China's very good at making that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, like, what the U.S. environmental community thinks about making EVs much more expensive because of this. Security, securitization uh, concern. You can't buy a Korean EV yeah. because it has a Chinese battery. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think is so interesting about the securitization is, right, all the normal interest group voices you would expect to be more vocal now are, are muted. Because it's a matter, it's become framed as a matter of national security. I just, sorry, two finger on this one. Uh, Tom, Can you, you use, the mic? The, use, use the mic? Oh, yeah. You made the point about sort of cheaper Chinese products coming into the U.S. through this sort of trade diversion uh, route. But if it is being diverted, it's not quite as cheap, right? Um, so mm -hmm. the Amer Americans aren't quite benefiting as much as... As they uh, would if it was direct. Right, right, right. So it's... Um, uh, it, it, the Americans are not well-served in that sense by this kind it's of... Not well, it's not it's really necessarily a question of well-served, because the U.S. current account deficit has gone way up. Right, so 2022 is the highest point of trade deficit the United States ever had. And this with all these tariffs up. up. And that's because countries who have export manufactured goods have found a way around the tariffs. But it's, it, I'm, I'm just saying it's not, it's not as if it's, um, you know, they're still benefiting from this kind of thing just indirectly. It's just not as, it's not as efficient as it could be. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. <clears throat> Did you want to answer? Um, I feel like this uh, answers Mitch's question about the anything that the U.S. or West can do in terms of infrastructure. Um, yeah, I think um, of course we hear a lot about these competition, uh, like uh, the G7 had a global partners uh, partnership for infrastructure investment, and your European Union has a global gateway, um, and these are supposedly to compete with the PRI in terms of funding uh, infrastructure development, but more from more from a mobile more from a point of view of mobilizing private sector capital rather than just. Uh, using state capital, and oftentimes the European Union and, and U.S. are ridiculed for the little amount of money they put on the table, like um, I guess four billion or something like that. Just um, if we compare to those kind of figures that usually cited for BRI, like trillion dollar loan. By the way, I don't think that's true um, because if we like I just talk about the the overseas uh, loans for Chinese uh, financial sector. Um, the year-end outstanding loans were never larger than 700 billion U.S. dollars in terms of overseas loans, and that includes everything. So, in terms of financing for for BRI, it's it's not going. It, it can't be more than one trillion loans that being yeah. Um, and so, and I think that, that kind of ridic ridiculing of um of of a Western uh, approach, I think it's a bit unfair because. Um, for sure, they're not going to just to f they are not going to just fund the project construction itself. The the kind of approach China takes, because there's just not in the interest of um, the, the U.S. And, and many of the European countries. Um, China is willing to fund this uh, construction or uh, the pro uh, construction of these projects because China has this sector has all the ethics cap capacity that it wants to promote. Um, which is absent, especially in the U.S. And in Europe, it's a bit different. There are still several very big con con uh, construction companies from Europe. Um, so in that sense, I think the Western approach is more about um, 
doing the early stage um, development of the project that would make those projects bankable. Um, and those, um, you don't need that much money. Um, you only need to prepare the project so that it will be um, accepted or bank bankable. Um, by, and, and actually, there's no shortage of um, uh, capital that would be willing to, to actually um, invest in infrastructure project contrary to the, the conventional wisdom. Because if a, a infrastructure project is properly packaged and properly prepared, it's actually a good kind of asset for some kind of institutional investors, and and actually the, the so it's, it could work even if um, the governments from Europe and US are only are not putting as much money on the table compared to the Chinese government. Yeah. Can I be quite annoying and actually ask a question to intervene in this issue? So I mean, it's interesting the framing of evading tariffs or they're getting around it or being smart Reverting. because. Well, it's, yeah, it's right, it's trade diversion, and it's a super normal strategy, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's what Japanese companies did, although they just invested in the U.S., right? And, and it's also a natural progression, right? And then the second thing is that we have, I mean, it's not clear that it's coordinated action. Like, from what I encounter in Vietnam and Taiwan and Mexico, like, you see a ton of totally state, totally privately owned, no intervention, small and medium manufacturers, right, moving to those areas. So I mean, I think the really interesting thing that touches, I think, on Yaling and on Andy's comments is that what the US would want to reduce the current account deficit is for us to make the shoes and stuff again. But we don't make those yeah. things. And so and we're not going to. Not right. So then the world that, you know, that China may want with its innovation ecosystem and the US may want with our industrial policy, which we now have an office for in the White House, right? And so like is a redundancy, right? It's for yeah. everybody to make their own things. Yeah. And so if we're going to do that, we should be willing to spend a lot of money. And I don't know if the politics, I mean, are the politics of that sustainable in China or in the US? I'm, I'm not recommending any of that. <laughs> <laughs> the I, president does. I, I believe in free trade, and I still believe in small yeah. government impact on the domestic economy, because I'm an old school conservative, and they, they don't exist anymore. Um, uh, but. Um, uh, so I'm not recommending anything. I'm just calling into question the idea that if China's government is is promoting exports in the way that excellent presentation suggests, that they, whether it's an in infrastructure or just in general, which seems to be the case because they've moved away from the, the consumption uh, strategy, then there are some policy pushes to create more exports than you otherwise would. That would help explain the current account surplus to some degree. Um, and the idea that consumers in other countries, including the United States, are not benefiting with che from cheaper products would only be true if bilateral U.S. tariffs prevented Chinese products from entering the United States directly, and that was the only way that Chinese products could enter the United States. Right. But that's obviously not the case. So rational Chinese companies have diversified their portfolio, just like American companies have made China plus one. And the result is we're still getting lots of value added from Chinese uh, factories. It's just that they're not the final products in, in as many as a high percentage of the cases. And the, the problem with that, from my perspective as a free trade person who doesn't want the US government controlling the US economy, um, is that the response very likely will be, given the domestic trends in the United States, that we need to cut off all trade, or we need to reduce all trade from all countries. Right. And that, you know, that, that was a real big success in the 1930s. Right. <laughs> no, I share, I share that view entirely. And it's interesting in light of, I mean, we do find this, this reorganization of interest that I think Yeling was highlighting. So we're at time, and I don't want to go over. I'm trying to be disciplined. Um, and, and, um, and so, but boy, there's a lot to talk about and digest and discuss. And so let us just thank, thank you for having me here to learn. And thanks for <laughs>